what I wanted to do is just kind of give you guys a little bit of my story here over the last nine months as I've started to explore the esports opportunity and put some money to work, learn a little bit about it, um, and then we'll open it up to, to questions at the end. Um, so kind of a little bit of history on, on me beyond what Dan had mentioned. So I got into the game business in 1991. And even at that time, there was a competitive gaming streak that kind of underscored the business. Back in the old Super Nintendo or the Sega Genesis days, we'd do it sitting on our couch playing. Um, at that time, NHL hockey was probably the big one that I loved back in those days. Um, more recently, um, I've been a private equity investor. I spent five years at Elevation Partners. Um, you might remember we did an investment in the video game space. We bought a couple of independent game developers, one called BioWare, one called Pandemic. We combined those two. We sold it back to EA in 2008. We later made investments in Facebook and, and Yelp. Um, and then post that, I started a mobile free-to-play game company called Rumble, which I still am the chairman of. We sold a control stake in that business last summer to a company called iDreamSky in China. And since then, I've kind of put back on the investor hat. I've been back out looking at a variety of spaces, virtual reality, alternative reality. Um, but where my focus has been drawn mostly over the last nine months is actually in the esports space. And I think, you know, that, that stemmed at least initially. Uh, you know, it's hard not to be attracted as an investor to markets where you see clear-cut demand, where the numbers are kind of staggering in terms of the number of people that are both playing and spectating. Um, and secondly, it's global. And third, you know, I, I think you always get excited when there's kind of underlying secular trends. So I've got two kids, 12 and 14, and their media consumption behavior is as different from what mine was as, as one can imagine, right? So my son's 12th birthday party was a couple weeks ago. He said, look, Dad, I got to go see this show. And I'm thinking, oh, he wants to go see a rock concert. No, no, he wanted to go see a couple of YouTube stars, guys I'd never heard of before. And the consumption that, that he and my daughter have on YouTube and now on Twitch has invariably kind of moved towards a set of content that I don't think any of us that grew up at least you know, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s could imagine. And I think that underscores the fact that every generation that comes along now is spending more and more time in different places consuming different kinds of media. And the one thing that's a constant is they're playing a lot of games. And when they're not playing games, they're on YouTube watching videos about it, whether it's Minecraft or, or otherwise. And that kind of underlying secular trend just tells me that you're going to see more and more eyeballs, more and more people, more and more money being spent by people consuming things much like what esports is starting to become. So um, as I kind of started to kick this off, I was thinking back to wh where it got started. And at least for me, my memory is it was the late 90s in Korea. So Blizzard led StarCraft launch. It's a big hit. But in Korea, because of the PC Bang cafes, it becomes a phenomenon. And folks within those cafes start to play the game and invariably want to find out who's the best player in the cafe. And once they've identified that person, it strikes them, geez, I wonder if our champion is better than the guy who's playing at the PC Bang across town. So they arrange a match. And pretty soon it becomes regional and then it becomes national. And it makes the fundamental transition from a game to a sport. And for me, that definition is about not whether it's really great competition and whether skill matters, but rather do people actually want to watch people who are really good at it play. A sport is something that's more than the game. It's entertainment. It's about that entertainment value. So that was, you know, what, nearly 20 years ago and, you know, kind of put my head down and haven't been focused on how it's evolved since then. But you wake up today and you see some pretty interesting numbers. So last year, with the League of Legends World Championship, more people watched that concurrently than watched the college football BCS championship game on television. It's a pretty big number, 33 million people. And if you just think that's League of Legends, think again. So Dota 2 at the International, which is their big major, they had 20 million spectators. That's bigger than anybody, any single game in the NBA Finals last year. So already the notion of competitive gaming attracting people who see it as entertainment has reached a threshold that's somewhat similar to what we're seeing in, in real world sports. 
Secondly, I think you've got, um, you know, you've got this large audience that's not only engaged based on those numbers I gave you, but if you look at the amount of time they're spending watching their favorite game, it's about an order of magnitude for people that watch their favorite sport. So the total number of time being spent by one of these fans, you know, transcends what you're seeing in the, in the regular sports world. And look, you know, I think as um, people have realized that these large spectating audiences are out there, a business has started to get built around it. So all of which compelled me to kind of put my head down and look into it. So in the last nine months, I've, I've invested in a couple of media technology companies, and I just signed a letter of intent to buy a team. And knock on wood, we, we close on that in August. So obviously, I've been bullish on the space. Having said that, and despite some of the amazing trend lines and the big numbers I just shared with you, there's some pretty fundamental challenges to esports from the perspective of being an investor. Um, so the first one is actually, I would, I would start it out by saying, I think it's a strength, and it's a really interesting piece of the, of the puzzle here. I don't think there's any sport that's emerged in the world that has a connection to its fans the way that video games do as an esport. There's this unique sense of ownership that I think the NFL and the NBA teams only wish they had. If you're a player of League of Legends and you start playing the game and you get on into the community and starting to play competitively, you actually feel like an owner when you see one of the great teams go up at the World Championships. You feel like an owner because oftentimes you actually identified some of those players when they first came up. You were playing pickup games with them. It was the equivalent afterwards in an online forum of hanging out with them at the local bar. There, there's, this, there, there's not this kind of arm's length sense that you see in the bigger traditional sports between the people on the court or the field that are making the entertainment value and the fans. It, it's one kind of symbiotic group. And that creates a stickiness and an opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors who want to get into this space and see it emerge as a big business, something pretty compelling to see. But at the same time, we're not seeing these people spend money. So I gave you the comparative numbers in terms of the spectating audiences on the NBA Finals versus Dota and League of Legends versus uh, uh, College Football Championship. Here, here's the other figure that's interesting. The average US sports fan, real world sports, spends about 70 bucks on that passion every year. In the esports world, in the US, it's about 70 cents. So that's good and bad, right? I mean, that's not a number that compels you tremendously about there being a big market today, but it also tells you there's a big opportunity. So I think one of the fundamental challenges as an investor, and I'd say that it's also the flip side, is it's an opportunity, is how do we monetize this fast-growing, very engaged spectating audience? Who are the companies out there that are going to figure out what they have to do to deliver, whether it's technology, the form of streaming, an aggregation of information about their favorite team or player or game in such a way that we can start to extract money from that value in the same way that real world sports does. It's a big gap, but it's also a big opportunity. But back to the, the kind of the, the, the tremendous sense of proprietariness that, that the fans have with the games and the sports. Valuable thing, and a uniquely valuable thing, but at the same time, it's, it's a challenge. So right now, if you look at the way that Twitch runs its business, and the way they focus on streamers, and the way they think about their audience, and if you look at the blizzards, or the valves, or the riots, and how they're engaging, and talking, and learning about their player base, and how they perceive this competitive opportunity around their games, a lot of it is coming from Reddit, and a lot of it is driven by this very, very vocal minority of, of, of fans. And it's, for you know, lack of another term, it's, it's really about everybody's kind of myopic view of how do we find the best players, how do we find the best teams? How do we make this the most competitive, fair exercise in determining the skill of these players? You don't ever hear anybody talk about entertainment value. You don't hear people talking about how do we grow the fan base. And once we've grown the fan base, how do we engage that fan base? There's a boat anchor of this vocal, passionate minority that kind of helped organically take esports 
from something small and very community-based to something that now has millions of people engaged, that at the same time is defining it in a way that I think is a limiter on its potential. So you know, you, you see this in, in terms of the lack of creativity about creative constructs around the competitions. So instead of thinking about them in ways that, hey, how is this going to engage a huge audience? You're seeing people talk about it in terms of how do we ruthlessly make this the fairest competition to determine who the best player in the world is. You see it in the, the content that gets created. You know, there's this overwhelming focus on the screen and what's happening inside the game when what all of us care about, whether we're watching the NBA, the NFL, or something else, is the players involved, the emotion. What's their storyline? Where did they come from? You know, if, if they talk smack about the guys they're going to play before the match started and then the thing starts to go the other way, we want to see the look on their face when they know they're going to get their butt kicked. Instead, the camera myopically shows you the pixels and the flying you know, VFX as the game goes on. It's, it may reward and scratch the itch for that very, very passionate, hardcore fan, but it's never going to turn this into a broad-based mass market entertainment medium that's investable again. And look, I, I think the game publishers um, struggle along the same lines. And by the way, this is nothing new in the video game business. I mean, 20 years ago, I bought a PC role-playing game company um, at the time was probably number one or number two in the entire industry. And this was just about the time that the internet had emerged, but before browsers. So there was you know, CompuServe and AOL had just come along, and you actually could hear and talk to your audience for the first time. And the developers absolutely fell in love with this loop. And so it turned out that the hardest core players of this RPG franchise were giving the most feedback. And of course, what did they want? They wanted the game to be more complex. They wanted more sophisticated features against the things they had already played. I mean, they were so passionate about the smallest granular detail of that game design, and they pushed those developers who believed this was their entire audience to go back and make the next iteration of the game one that would fulfill all of their you know, fondest wishes. And so what did they do? They did it, and the next game sold less. And they did it again, and the next game sold less. You know, we, we are a business that oftentimes can cater not only to the people that are making the games who tend to be hardcore gamers themselves, but, but also the, the very, very vocal minority. And we lose sight of, hey, there's a bunch of other people who love to have played this game, but they didn't understand it, it wasn't accessible or whatever. That same lesson applies to esports today. So think about it this way. You know, when, when somebody walks into, well, even as a young kid, when you're learning about sports, and your dad's got the television on, and there's a football game or a basketball game, without asking, you can pick up and figure out the rules pretty quickly. You turn on a League of Legends match, and you walk in, and you've never played the game, it's pretty overwhelming. And your sense of what's going on and getting context, pretty tough. The game itself is difficult. Secondly, because I talked about it before, they're not really talking about the players, the narratives, there's really no education going on really hard to come to grips with what you're seeing. Therefore, the spectating audiences are in large part limited to the player bases of each of the games. That's got to change. And by the way, that, that is an opportunity as an investor. How do we, again, find companies and people have a vision and say, hey, this could be mass market entertainment. And we're seeing games that are simpler to understand. I mean, one of the companies I work with is Supercell. In the Clash Royale, they've got a real-time PvP game on mobile. So there's three billion people in the world that could play it. It's incredibly easy to understand, yet it's competitive and interesting enough to want to know who's the best in the world at it. There's a chance there to do something really, really interesting in a way that hasn't been done before. And hopefully not only continue to broaden the size of the market, but shrink that gap between the 70 cents a year that esports fans are spending and the $70 that real world sports fans are spending. I think the second mitigant and, and the the second reason you see maybe less investment in the space to date than you might imagine, given the big metrics and what seems to be secular wins that are only going to make this market bigger, is the fact that the IP that underscores the game is owned by a game publisher. So obviously vastly different than the world of basketball, football, or soccer, where no one owns the underlying intellectual property. But in this case, you've got multi-billion dollar market cap companies who are in a very different business than the esports. 
They either sell their games at retail for 50 or 60 bucks or they're free to play with in-app purchase building billion dollar businesses behind this intellectual property. And in the game business, if you own that IP, you want to control it. And secondly, if there's a new opportunity to do something different with it, you want to be the one to do it. You don't want to let somebody else do it. So over these first, let's call it, you know, uh, three innings of the esports market, it has grown way slower than the demand from the players or the fans, principally because the game publishers have softened that growth. They, they've wanted to look at this as an extension of their own marketing. Hey, this is great. There's this competitive esport thing that our players started doing. That's going to keep them engaged. That's going to allow us to build a robust community. We might even get some viral marketing out of it. It's beautiful. But because they believe either they can take advantage of how that esport has to emerge as a league, as competitive structures, as an organization of teams, as the broadcasters, and they want to have their finger on that at every step of the way, they fundamentally slowed the growth. Look, no matter how great Valve is or Riot is or Activision and Blizzard is at building world-class games, they're not experts in mass market entertainment and they're not experts on building out sports leagues. That's just not what they do. Yet they're trying to do it to varying degrees. So the lack of humility and awareness is, is a challenge for them. The second piece is that need to feel like, hey, it's our intellectual property, it's our trademark. I can't let people go do things with this that are outside our control. My God, the world would end. And so this is part of the problem. When I talk about describing watching a Twitch stream of the, the you know, the the League of Legends World Championships, and the focus is on the screen instead of on the player, and the narrative is terribly done. It, it isn't necessarily because those people in the esports business don't want it to be interesting and more entertaining than the spectators. It's because they're mandated by the game publishers to keep the camera on the game. And, and I think, look, there's dozens of other examples of the, of the way that the game publishers can't seem to break out of the paradigm of looking at this like a marketing or community extension and instead say, oh my God, we might have a multi-billion dollar business if we could just let people that really understand the sports world take this and run with it. So w while that sounds, I think, maybe a little bit pessimistic, I, I think that can and will change. I think there's some recognition, and I, and I suspect that Riot um, is going through this right now because they've been the most hands-on. And in some ways, they've had a lot of success building out the, the LCS and building it into a you know, a, a formidable, remarkable presence. But at the same time, it's getting to the size and the sophistication of the people that are buying the teams and the amount of money that's being poured into it is kind of transcending, I think, their ability to manage it effectively. And I think they're having that conversation internally saying, hey, is it about time that we start to partner and think about people that can build a world-class league, the equivalent of the NFL around our game? And geez, maybe if we do, and we'll set a set of guidelines to protect our intellectual property and our brand, we can actually get 10 times the value that we're getting today in terms of player engagement, marketing virality, and by the way, have a brand new revenue stream that can be every bit as meaningful as the primary one we have. I don't think it's going to happen overnight, but I think it's going to happen incrementally. And I think there's some catalysts that will make that happen. I think part of it, um, you know, Dan mentioned that one of the groups I'm working with is Philadelphia 76ers. So you're getting existing professional team ownerships, oftentimes with billionaires behind them, that want to be in the esports business with world-class people going out and grabbing sponsorships and working with players and forming leagues. By doing that, we'll be able to turn up the quotient on the entertainment value and get back to the metrics that matter, how big is our fan base and how engaged are they, and be really good at monetizing that in a way that at the end of the day is going to make the fans really excited, but it's also going to create a tremendous amount of opportunity not only for those game publishers, but for a bunch of entrepreneurs and other companies in the space. So I guess I'm optimistic enough that you're going to see that evolve, that we're going to get out from under the kind of being held captive by the local or the vocal minority of the hardcore players. And secondly, the game publishers are going to realize that by letting go a little bit, they can actually make something great happen. So for that reason, I'm spending quite a bit of time and money in the space. So look, that, that's, that's what I had in terms of... Um, uh, you know, some of my thoughts, but happy to take questions from anybody. Uh, uh, Mark Atkinson, Vesta. Uh, you mentioned one uh, issue was uh, 70 cents per capita uh, spend. 
Typically, is, is that mostly viewers spending money? And if yes, how are they actually, what are they buying? Yeah, you know, it, it's, the industry is, you know, for lack of a better description, still a wild west. It's in its kind of very early stages. So even the data that you can get and collect isn't particularly very accurate. So I think the number you see quoted about the total size of the market is about $750 million last year. Um, but of course, you know, I talked to Twitch, which is right now the, the media 800-pound gorilla in this space. And you know, they believe the estimate of their revenue as part of that $750 million was exaggerated by several multiples. There is some money coming there. And I think Twitch is getting incrementally better at figuring out how to monetize the, the eyeballs that are seeing it. But you're seeing a lot of money from merchandising. You're starting to see the game publishers play around with in-app purchase, where you can go back and, and get the config of your favorite player or the skin of your favorite team. Uh, you see some money coming from events. The ticket sales are, are pretty small. The growth area is in sponsorships, right? So if you can imagine the advertising world looking and saying, oh my God, the hardest to reach demographic in the world is spending literally billions of minutes every month spectating on esports. How do I get my brands in front of those people? And again, I think that's a big opportunity uh, in the space once people can effectively package and market to those sponsors in a way that they're used to being sold to. I'm curious, when you buy an esports team, what exactly are you buying? Yeah, um, it, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's, there's kind of three things today that make that up, and I'll go in, I think, ascending order of importance, at least from my perspective. Today, people think they're buying a slot in the LCS um, because that costs money, and it has real material value in the way that Riot monetizes and exposes those teams. Um, the, the second piece that you're buying is the fan base that's already been accrued. So there's um, a lot of folks, whether it's on social media or whether it's through Twitch, who are fans of these teams and they care deeply about it. And if you buy a brand that has a large fan following, that has intrinsic value. And then lastly, and most importantly, it's the people involved. Look, I mean, you know, it's, it's all well and good for somebody like me that's been in this space broadly to come in and say, hey, I think there's a bunch of value that can be provided in addition to capital if you let me be an owner of your team. But the actual scouting of these talented players, the chemistry of putting a team together, the day-to-day -day management of that team to optimize for competitive success, you know, that's an art form in and of itself. And there's a handful of people that have been doing it for five to ten years that you absolutely want to have helping you run your team. Thank you so much. Great question, Greg. Very good.